Welcome to an important event in the life of the body of Christ. It's our Good Friday service. Because of the current situation surrounding the COVID-19 restrictions, this video is a way for the body of Christ to connect. Connect to this foundation of reality around the death of Jesus Christ and what it means for us. Him substituting his perfect sinless life for the death we deserve as sinners. We do, we do this, a, a Good Friday service, so that we as believers don't skip too quickly to the celebration of Jesus' resurrection without first remembering what our sins cost Jesus. We will let the scriptures tonight tell the simple, powerful story, and we will end our time this evening with a time of communion, the Lord's Supper. Let me give you some instructions for that communion time so you are ready. I'm gonna place these instructions on the screen for you here. When you see them come up, perhaps simply hit pause on your video and then follow the instructions so that you are ready for the communion time at the end of our service. Let's begin our service tonight. Some things are hard to look at, aren't they? It's hard to look at an accident or two people fighting or if there's blood because of a wound or if there's terrible suffering. It, it's in our nature to shield our eyes from the things that we would consider unlovely. The Old Testament book of Isaiah even prophesied that when the Messiah came, we would want to look away from the suffering that he had. In fact, it says this in Isaiah 53, three to six. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. But what if the suffering that someone else is enduring is because of us? And even more so, what if they suffered and we benefited from that? Then I think we should not turn away. Then we should look at the suffering and what it cost that person and allow it to motivate our personal commitments. The death of Jesus on the cross is not just history. It's not just business as usual. It is very personal. So as we go through this brief service tonight, I encourage you, take it personally. In a moment, we're gonna review through the Holy Scriptures, the, the four gospels, what they record for us about the death of Jesus. But first, Let's use some candles to depict Jesus' life and ministry. He was called the light of the world. It was only 108 days ago that our Grace Point Church family gathered on Christmas Eve. We lit four candles. We called them the Advent wreath to remember Christ's birth. And then at the end of the service, after we had lit those four candles one at a time, we took the light and we actually spread it around the whole congregation. We just enjoyed filling the church worship center with a, a precious glow. Back then, we were anxious to go home and be with each other. Right now, we can't be with each other. But not only is it different because of, of the shelter-in-place, stay-at-home directives that are happening to us, there's a very different theme behind the celebration of the birth of Christ. And on the other hand, remembering the death of Jesus. Most of us have been to both kinds of gatherings, a birthday party and a funeral. At one of those, we light candles and we sing a joyous song and, and we eat cake. But tonight, after remembering the death of Jesus, we will remember the cost of eternal life. We won't be eating birthday cake. We will be celebrating around the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper. Even if it's by video, we get to connect 
around this important opportunity to remember. So let's begin by remembering why Jesus is called the light of the world. As I light these candles one at a time, they depict something about Jesus's life. Candle number one, Jesus was born as a baby in Bethlehem, the city of David fulfilling prophecy. Candle number two, at the age of 12, Jesus was perfectly obedient to God's will for his life and his perspective was clear about his heavenly father even when he was 12 years old. Candle number three, Jesus' first miracle was at Cana. He turned water into wine at a wedding, symbolic of his love for the church, his holy bride. Candle number four, Jesus preached and taught the principles of God's kingdom and clearly declared that our submissive hearts are the primary real estate. We are where the rule and realm of God's kingdom on earth takes place. Candle number five, Jesus performed miracles in nature, such as stilling a storm and walking on the water, which depicted his power as the God of creation. Candle number six, Jesus healed the sick, revealing a compassion for crowds of people in need and revealing him to be God, even over sickness and illness. In candle number seven, Jesus raised people from the dead, proving him to be the God over life and death and declaring himself to be the son of God sent to provide a way of salvation for our lost souls. But all this led to his rejection, his suffering, his death, part of God's plan to pay and atone for our rebellious sin. Isaiah 53, four to six says this, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's use the Holy Scriptures tonight to read and remember the death and the eventual burial of Jesus in a tomb. I've asked seven individuals from our church family to read the biblical gospel accounts of the story of Jesus' suffering and death. From their own homes, they will read these passages of Scripture. Please listen carefully with intention. At the end of each passage, I'm gonna make a few brief observations and then symbolize Jesus' suffering and death by extinguishing one of the lights of Jesus' life. Step number one, Jesus is mocked and condemned to death. Mark 15, 12 to 20. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. It's alarming to picture Jesus, the perfect, holy Son of God, the one who reigned at the right hand of the throne of God, the Father, now being mocked 
beaten, even spit upon. How shocking. Do you remember that story in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus used his saliva? Not to belittle or scorn someone, but he actually made some mud and he healed a man who was deaf and mute. But now, here, at the end of Jesus' life, Jesus endures the humiliation of being spit upon. As the soldiers try to destroy Jesus in spirit before they destroy his body, they mock him. What a contrast between what sinful humankind does and what a gracious holy God does. It is painful to look at Jesus, now bruised and bloodied, spit upon and mocked. But our sins led Jesus to his death. Step number two, Jesus accepts the cross. John 19, 16b through 17. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Now Jesus is on his way. And the name of his destination is Golgotha, a word meaning skull. Everybody knew that to be taken to Golgotha was a one-way trip to a painful, brutal death. It was said in the Bible times that if you saw a man carrying a cross accompanied by Roman soldiers walking away from the city, you could be sure that man was not going to walk back. It was a one-way trip. This scene is especially vivid because Jesus is literally carrying something that doesn't belong to him. It belongs to us, to you, to me. It's a cross. It's the instrument, the cause of his death. It would be like today asking a condemned man to carry the rifles for his firing squad or needles and syringe for his own lethal injection. It seems out of place, but remember, our sins led Jesus to his death. Step number three. Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus carry the cross. And they led him away to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Mark 15, 20 through 22. I'm surprised how much we're actually told about this man, Simon. We know where he's from, Cyrene. We know he's got kids, they're named Alexander and Rufus, and we know he really wasn't connected to what was going on in the city. He is literally labeled a passerby. Don't you feel a little sorry for poor Simon? I mean, what does he have to do with any of this? Grabbed out of a crowd, forced to carry Jesus' cross, he's no doubt delayed and sidetracked perhaps for hours from the scheduled event that he was on his way to, and yet, think about it. Simon really represents all of us. Any one of us, pick at random, anyone in the world actually deserved the cross that Jesus is carrying more than Jesus did. We often smugly think, oh, we don't have to be involved or life isn't fair, especially now at this time in our history. But Jesus was really the only truly innocent man at this whole scene. We, on the other hand, are all sinners. We deserve to carry the cross. It is, after all, ours, not Jesus's. And yet, our sins led Jesus to his death. Step number four, Jesus is stripped of his garments. Reading from John's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 23 and 24. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. 
We have a saying, it goes like this. To the victor goes the spoils. It means that if you're the winner, you get what the loser lost. The soldiers are here in this passage feeling like great victors, but what did they really get? Some torn cloth, a one-piece garment for which they gambled. Here's the Son of God, the creator of the earth, the giver and taker of life and eternity. And what do they want? They want his clothes. It's ironic that the one who could give them the one thing they need, eternal life, they're only wanting from him the things that are temporary, wrappings of a human body. Jesus was at that moment, however, winning eternal life. And we know he would have granted it even to those soldiers because remember, he granted it to one of the thieves. Let me ask you tonight, what do you want from Jesus? He died to give you the eternal, and yet how often we have sinful eyes only on the things that are temporary. Remember, our sins led Jesus to his death. Step number five, Jesus is nailed to the cross. Matthew 27, verses 36 through 40. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Do you suppose this is where we invented the saying, adding an insult to an injury? Few things, I think, are as directly satanic as questioning the power and purpose of God. In fact, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, Satan's first words ever spoken to Eve were an invitation to question God's truth and authority. He said in Genesis 3.1, did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? And now here at the end of Jesus' earthly life, the same kind of insulting words came from the passing crowd and you can see Satan's fingerprints all over this cynical questioning as if it had taken place way back in the Garden of Eden. Only this time these words are repeated to Jesus' very face as he hangs on the cross. And the same questioning of God's purpose and authority comes from Satan, comes from the mouths of sinful men. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. Let me ask, have you ever questioned the authority and power and purpose of God in your life? Yeah, I have too. Remember, our sins led Jesus to his death. Step number six, Jesus dies on the cross. And so we come to it, the actual death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Luke 23, 44 through 46. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun had stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had done this, he breathed his last. It is in fact significant that the Gospel of Luke mentions such a very specific time for Jesus' death. He says, the ninth hour. That's our 3 p.m. in the afternoon. It coincides to the time when the second daily sacrifice of a lamb happened at the temple in Jerusalem. And especially on this Passover day, anyone near the temple could have heard the sound of the shofar, the piercing sound of that ram's horn blown from a high tower on the temple mount as the sound reached the city streets. It signified that at that very moment, the ninth hour, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, a knife is drawn across the throat of an innocent lamb. The blood would be collected and brought to the altar. But on this day of Jesus' crucifixion, at this very moment, the ninth hour, another lamb, the Lamb of God, the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, is being slain. 
outside the city on a hill of death called Golgotha. The Gospel of John chapter 19 also records some of Jesus' final words as, It is finished. In our English Bible, it's three words. But it was actually one word that Jesus cried out. Tetelestai. It's a common word in the Greek marketplace that describes satisfaction that something has been completed. This word would often be stamped across a bill that had been paid in full, a project completed. Jesus is stepping back from the suffering because he is paying our sin in full. And he declared the work of salvation completed. Just think about this. Jesus' last breath on a cross happened in darkness after speaking to his Father. And he gave that last breath for you and for me while accomplishing his Father's will to win our eternal life. We take our breaths for granted. <sighs> Maybe not so much in this COVID-19 virus season. But the truth is, we will, every one of us, be at a certain time in a certain place when we take our last breath on this earth. And just as Jesus' last breath happens on a cross, ours will happen on earth someday. But what does his last breath have to do with me 2,000 years later? Jesus said in John 6:40, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him at the last day. Jesus died to provide a way to make sure that our last breath on earth can be our first breath for eternity. Have you ever responded to his stirring, his death, his gift? Remember, our sins led Jesus to his death. Listen to this song or sing along with this song that you know. Marshall is going to sing a song that reminds us of the power in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The blood will never lose its power.
Step seven, Jesus is taken down from the cross. John 19, 34 through 38. One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. Matthew 27, 59. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. It all sounds so brutal and final, doesn't it? Words like pierced, flow of blood and water. And yet the gospel writer John himself made sure that we understand it's true. He saw it with his own eyes. Don't doubt him. It's as if John is declaring you'd better believe it. To anyone who might doubt or be tempted to look away from the awful sight of Jesus' dead body hanging limply on a cross. Now it's suddenly all quiet. And so Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, two secret disciples, attend Jesus in his death. Isn't it interesting that Jesus' birth well, that was actually attended by a Joseph, his stepfather? And now another Joseph attends his death. The name Joseph means to add or to increase. Jesus' death is always available to save one more. When I was a kid, I used to hear this old song on the ra radio and people would sing it. It went something like this. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. There's always room to add one more to the list of people for whom Jesus died. And that is the gospel truth. Our sins led Jesus to his death. The reality of Jesus' death and what he accomplished for us should be remembered. His death happened to Jesus, but it happened for us to accomplish a plan of salvation. So we must regularly take the time to ponder this price. Now, what better way to do that than the way Jesus commanded to gather to remember his broken body, his spilled blood. The Apostle Paul said it like this, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he comes. Let me, before we begin communion, read the account of what happened at Jesus' Last Supper in Matthew 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and he offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. So we come to what we call, and what the Bible refers to as the Lord's table. It is a holy table. It is open to any of you. I invite you all to participate as long as you've submitted to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and are walking in a right relationship with other believers. The Apostle Paul calls on believers in Corinth to, he calls it, personally examine yourselves, to look into your own souls before you partake of this bread and this cup and remember what Jesus did for you. You want to be sure that you're walking in a right relationship with this God of grace. And that's why we in our church always pause to take a few moments just to remember that because we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. So if there's anything between you and the Lord or you and other believers, take a few moments now in personal reflection to speak to Jesus Christ in prayer and prepare your heart for this communion time. Matthew 26, 26 says that while they were still eating, Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it. 
And the act of breaking the bread is a reminder that Jesus allowed his body to be broken for you. So I encourage you now, hand out the bread to those you are with or break the bread that you have. And remember, do this in remembrance of Jesus' broken body for you. Scripture says that in the same way Jesus took a cup. It was very likely that third cup during the Passover celebration. And Jesus held the cup up and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you whenever you drink it. So we're remembering that Jesus not only suffered for us and allowed his body to be broken, Jesus died for us. He allowed his blood to be spilled so that we might have that relationship, that new covenant, that new testament through his blood to our heavenly father. Let's remember his spilled blood for our sins. The apostle Paul said it like this, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, You've now remembered the Lord's death until he comes, and oh, he is coming again. A reminder that Jesus Christ came not only the first time, but he will come a second time in victory. And I want to live for him. Thank you for choosing to share this time with us this evening. Not only the time of remembering Jesus' death, but now remembering through this communion time that we have connected together. Though the body has not been physically present with each other, we have been present through the truth and the presence of Jesus Christ. Allow this last song that you're going to hear Marshall sing to be a time of contemplation. Just listen to the words and, and ask yourself what it is you can do to be grateful for Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us. You're welcome to join us as we move after this service on Sunday morning to a time of hope for our Easter video that will include both a sunrise service, something with the youth, and, and Dottie will speak. Um, she represents our children's department. But we want to encourage you to remember this tonight and allow this time to touch your heart with anticipation.
you pour down like a rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay. Finding myself at a loss for